So the current clinical biomarkers that are used to assess high-intensity focused ultrasound, not only for breast cancer treatments, but in general, when you're doing it under MRI guidance, are typically thermal or vascular based. So for the thermal, you're able to get the MR temperature images and you're able to calculate if you'd like cumulative thermal dose, which can be seen here by this equation. So this is an equation that takes into account the temperature rise and decay over time and calculates a single dose number. So that is seen here in this preclinical study that evaluated um, high intensity focused ultrasound in a goat udder. Several sonications were applied and you can see how the thermal dose accumulated over time and you can see that in these three views where the threshold of 240 cumulative equivalent minutes was applied to determine tissue necrosis. Now we can also evaluate this by systemically injecting a gadolinium based contrast agent and evaluating the contrast enhanced MRI. So seen here on the top, you have the goat udder that was evaluated immediately after the ablation, and then it was returned 14 days later. So you can see the difference between the two. Now the problem with doing the vascular assessment acutely right after the treatment is that um, you can have some effects that are just only there because of the immediateness of the assessment. So you can have edema, you can have hemorrhage, and some of these things can mask the true treatment effect. These are typically gone several days after the treatment, and so you can see it's a much cleaner image, and you can see the dark area, uh, the hypo-intense area, indicates where efficacious ablation did occur. So it is clear that there is improvement in MR temperature is needed if MR temperature is going to be used as a biomarker. Now, as I've mentioned previously, MR thermometry that's used clinically is now only really available in the aqueous-based tissue. So for breast, that would be in the fibroglandular tissue and the tumor. And this is because fat lacks the hydrogen bonding that the proton resonance frequency technique does need to give an accurate temperature rise assessment. Now, this plot here is one that I had in one of my papers several years ago. And this is interesting because it shows um, on the x-axis you have the energy that was deposited during a high-intensity focused ultrasound ablation and the temperature rise that was achieved. And you can see for the same amount of energy for the different patients, different temperature rises were achieved. Now, this is not as repeatable as we would like, and we attributed this high variability to several things. One is the lack of monitoring in fat. So even though the temperature was being assessed in the fibroglandular tissue or the tumor, that may not have been where the ultrasound beam was truly focused. Now, there is a change of tissue properties with temperature that can occur, and that is not taken into account here. In addition, if there's minor patient motion, whether that down to cardiac or respiratory motion or just bulk motion of the patient, um, while corrected for mildly here, it really was not taken into account enough. And perhaps all of these combined factors can explain some of the variability. Now, in this particular example, it's a new technique that has been developed by Svedin et al., where they are using a hybrid thermometry approach. So they are not only measuring the proton resonance frequency technique in the aqueous-based tissues, but they are also measuring the change in T1 value, which in MR is the longitudinal relaxation time, which has also been shown to be linear with temperature over a specific range. So what you're gonna have here in these two movies are there are two cadaver breasts. One is a heterogeneous breast where you can see the darker area is the fibroglandular tissue surrounded by the fat, which is brighter, where the bottom is a pretty homogeneously fatty breast. And you can see here as the ultrasound is applied, you're getting measurements both in the proton resonance frequency in the glandular tissue as well on the far right in the fat. Now on the bottom, because this is an entirely fatty breast, you'll notice the proton resonance frequency, you're really not getting anything on here, but when you measure the T1, you are able to see that temperature rise as an increase uh, of the T1 measurement itself. So this is a potential technique that could be used and very important in breast cancer treatments to measure the temperature in both fat and fibroglandular and tumor tissues. So this is shown here in a phantom where you can see uh, where in the phantom that is aqueous based only that you do have a PRF temperature rise 
in this phantom. However, with the T1 change, there is nothing there. However, you can see that in both of these curves, they did track very well. Now notice in the black, this is the PRF temperature, which is a temperature rise. And in the red, you have the T1 change of the temperature. Now, this is important because you're measuring T1 change and you'll need to calibrate that back eventually to the temperature. But still, it's a, an extremely promising technique. So everything I've shown thus far is really shown to treat the local breast cancer. And as I mentioned earlier in the talk, um, the standard of care for breast cancer is really more of a combination therapy. You're gonna combine surgery with radiation therapy or chemotherapy or perhaps an immunotherapy, just depending on the patient and the tumor type. So high intensity focused ultrasound has a real potential to be applied as part of these combination therapies. For example, it could be used as a combination with a nanotechnology. It could also be used um, as perhaps as a drug delivery technique if a drug delivery is delivered by a mechanical or a thermal effect. It can also be combined with immunotherapy or chemotherapy. So I will now describe some of the potential of high intensity focused ultrasound with a, a combinator combinatorial approach. So in this paper by Aiden et al, it was really interesting. They applied mechanical high intensity focused ultrasound and they pulsed it. So if you remember, we're describing this as a lower duty cycle. In this case, they were applying about 10 millisecond length bursts at a 10 Hertz repetition frequency. And they found that when you apply this at a high enough pressure in this paper, uh, greater than four megapascals, that they were able to turn a cold or an immunosuppressive tumor environment after the focused ultrasound, they were tr able to turn it into a hot tumor environment where it had anti-tumor effects. So this is very interesting because while a preclinical study, they were able to show it in two animal models, both uh, a B16 melanoma tumor and a 4T1 breast tumor. So this could have a lot of potential as being applied as part of a combination therapy for breast cancer treatment. So in this paper by Scalina, they applied the ultrasound in this lower duty cycle, about a 50% slower duty cycle. And they actually termed this low intensity focused ultrasound or LOFU. And they interestingly paired this with a radiation therapy. And this was done preclinically. And so they did it in three different types of mice all with a 4T1 tumor. And it's interesting because when you look at these different columns, they're applying the treatments, uh, no treatment at all with this blue, with the control. In the red, they applied the low intensity focused ultrasound alone. And in the green, they applied radiation therapy alone. However, when they applied the high intensity, the low intensity focused ultrasound, excuse me, and the radiation therapy, you'll see in these two mice, they, had, uh, they were able to cure the tumors in seven out of 11 and nine out of 16. When you compare them to the others applied as a monotherapy, none of those were seen. So this is very encouraging. They also found in this study that as they um, varied the power that they were able to elicit different increases in these heat shock protein peptide complexes. And as I mentioned earlier, this is very interesting as it's indicative of an anti-tumor effect. So this is showing how high intensity focused ultrasound with radiation could be a very interesting combination therapy. Now this study that came out of the University of Virginia um, from Natasha Shabani et al. showed that if you apply thermal HIFU with a chemotherapeutic agent, in this case gemcitabine, in a preclinical 4T1 mouse model, that you're able to get really interesting results. Now the thermal HIFU, they applied sparsely, meaning they weren't attempting to get a contiguous lesion, they were just um, ablating the tumor in sections. Now when they did this, they compared a, a sham treatment or a control tumor to the focused ultrasound only with the thermal effect, gemcitabine only, and then the combination therapy. And this is very interesting because both the tumor area and the overall survival on the light green, they increased when you had the combination therapy of the high intensity focused ultrasound with the gemcitabine. And this is very interesting because these really great results are now informing a clinical trial that is currently recruiting. 
Now, a couple of studies have ev evaluated high-intensity focused ultrasound comparing a mechanical bioeffect to a thermal bioeffect when used in combination. So this study from Fight et al. out of Stanford University, they compared CPG as a, a primer, an immune primer, to uh, alpha PD-1, an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And they did this again preclinically. Now they had several interesting results in this study. The first is both thermal HIFU and mechanical HIFU, they did cause cell death as you would occur, as you would assume. So both of them were able to successfully kill tumor cells. Now interestingly, they found that the mechanical high intensity focused ultrasound had a more positive effect than the thermal. So the mechanical high intensity focused ultrasound, when combined with the immunotherapy, it did cause cancer reduction. Now in this particular study, not as much as the immunotherapy alone, but still a very positive result. Now when you look at the histology that compared the thermal HIFU to the mechanical HIFU, some interesting things. They found that with the thermal HIFU, you wanted to get the temperature rise above 60 degrees centigrade. It's also very important that you actually leave some of the viable tissue there to get a good response. They found that the mechanical HIFU was more rapid cell death than the thermal HIFU, and you can really see that when you compare the histology, uh, especially when compared with the control tumor. So this study in general found that the mechanical HIFU as a combinatorial uh, effect was more effective in what they were looking at. Now a second study also evaluated this. They compared the mechanical HIFU, you know, applied in the pulse mode, to a more thermal mechanism where they were applying this uh, similar to what Scalina had done with a lower duty cycle. And these had very interesting results as well. They found particularly similar to the prior study that the mechanical HIFU had the approved effect, that they had both lower tumor volumes over time, as well as improved survival. And this study, they were combining the HIFU again with an immune checkpoint inhibitor, in this case with the alpha PD-1. And so this had a similar result and is also very interesting in informing uh, future both preclinical work and cl clinical work. Now HIFU can also be used um, not only to be combined with immunotherapy, but also as a drug delivery agent. So in this case, um, uh, a particle was de designed that was a thermosensitive liposome, where they put both a chemotherapeutic agent in it as well as an MR contrast agent. So this is quite interesting from an MR-guided HIFU point of view because then with the contrast agent, you will be able to visualize where these liposomes are being collected. So in this case, they compared several groups in a preclinical model. There was no treatment. They used just the drug alone, and then they had the encapsulated drug, both without and with the focused ultrasound. And you can see here, when they had the drug in the thermal sensitive liposome uh, with both the MRI and the chemotherapeutic agent, you were able to get a much better result as seen here by tumor volume and the survival curves. So this is a very interesting result. And indeed, they also found that with the contrast agent on board, they were able to see um, actually where it was accumulated. And this is very interesting because then perhaps you're able to use this to determine the timing of when you want the focused ultrasound and exactly where you're wanting to target. So this is a clinical trial that also explores some of the different aspects of high intensity focused ultrasound. So this is a combination therapy where they're not only treating, they're not treating the local disease, but they're treating metastases. So in this case, um, they are treating metastases that are happening in the brain because of breast cancer, and these metastases are HER2 positive. And so what they're doing is they're using the high-intensity focused ultrasound to open the blood-brain barrier so they're able to deliver a monoclonal antibody to treat this, or in this case, trastuzumab. So as you can see here on this image, in a contrast-enhanced MRI image, you're able to see the tumor itself. Now the next image in B here is showing when they apply the focused ultrasound as a pulsed uh, mechanical, combining that with microbubbles, they're able to open the blood-brain barrier up and what you're seeing here is the acoustic dose that they're delivering. So in the next image you can actually see after they've given gadolinium contrast agent where the blood-brain barrier is open, demonstrating that it is successful. Now interestingly on the far right when they perform the same scan, 24 hours later, the blood-brain barrier is closed. Now using SPECT image 
with um, a radio label, they're able to show the difference when you have MR-guided high-intensity focused ultrasound and without it. And you see it here on the left, four hours and then 48 hours after. And in this case, they were showing a 100% increase in the uptake of this drug. So the potential of high-intensity focused ultrasound to treat breast cancer, as I mentioned early in the talk, is not only for the local therapy, but for um, more advanced metastatic disease, as you can see here. So now that I've given an example of all those results, I just wanna conclude by showing what breast cancer treatments are enrolling. So for thermal ablation, you have one going on at UMC Utrecht where they're evaluating the MR high food device and they're looking at ablation efficacy and they're evaluating this both with an MR metric of DCE MRI or dynamic contrast MRI and histology. At Columbia University, they're evaluating the harmonic motion imaging ultrasound guided system. And again, they're looking at the primary outcomes of the harmonic motion imaging compared to the histology as well as the areas of the lesion. There's another trial going on at the Institut Bergonier in Bordeaux, France, where they're evaluating the MUSE system that uses MR-guided high-intensity focused ultrasound to evaluate the ablation of the tumor, and they're evaluating this based on the histologic criteria. A similar study is also going on at the University of Utah where they're looking at the feasibility of the MUSE device. Now, this is mainly a safety trial, but they're also looking at efficacy. There's several combination therapies going on at the University of Virginia. They are looking at focused ultrasound with a low-dose gemcitabine, and they're looking at this to enhance immune response, and this was based off the preclinical trial that was shown earlier in this presentation. They're also looking at how HIFU can be used with anti-PD-1, and they're looking at not only the toxicity, but how the infiltration and treated metastases are also affected. Now at UMC Utrecht, they have one where they're looking at image-guided targeted with doxorubicin, and they're actually delivering this with hypothermia, so they're not going for thermal necrosis. Um, now the primary outcome is adverse events. They're looking at the MR temperature data, but they're also looking at the radiological response on MRI and CT. Now a couple exciting trials at Sunnybrook uh, in Toronto. They're looking at how ultrasound can use to simulate microbubble radiation. And they're, and they're looking at this for the chest wall and locally advanced breast cancers. They're also continuing the study I was showing with the blood-brain barrier disruption with HER2 positive tumors and breast cancer brain metastases. So I hope I've convinced you that HIFU has disruptive potential for the treatment of breast cancer, not only for the local disease control, but also with the combination therapy for the treatment of more advanced metastatic disease. Now both ultrasound and MRI guided um, techniques have been described here, and they're both effective and they have different factors to consider. Exciting preclinical work is being translated to clinical trials, and it's my opinion that we're going to need more improved quantitative metrics and biomarkers that will be able to further expand the potential of this. Thank you for your time and interest. I really appreciate the ability to be able to highlight different investigators' work. If there were any omissions in this, it was not intentional. Thank you for your time.